Today we're looking at Mark chapter number 9, verses number 33 to verse number 35. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat them down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Praise God. The greatest shall be least. Jesus is trying to make it clear the one who wants to be in high position must first acquaint themselves to low position. Humility is the direction, that's the route, that's the journey that Jesus takes us on as he excels us. We humble ourselves, he exalts. Humility is the key. And humble means that we've got to become broken. Broken is the most challenging most challenging fate for a Christian. Because broken means that it's not about you anymore. Whenever you break something, you think about all the contents, what is in it to flow out. And you lose the contents of whatever you had that contained that. But when you're broken, God lets you get rid of all of you so he can put you back together and fill you with him. It's a whole different broken experience. And you're better in the latter than you were in the former. But you have to go through a period of brokenness so that God can use us. I was watching Chris Cox, who's a horse trainer, and he travels all over the world doing exhibitions and clinics. And his horses that he has, he rides without a bridle or a saddle. And those horses are taught to obey over 50 different commands. All of the turns and motions and the steps, the jumps, are all done by simple commands. He either nudges them a certain way or says a certain word or makes a sound or taps them a certain way. And those horses have learned how to obey. And he said that the more broken a horse is, the more commands they will obey. And they were asking, how do you train the horses? He said, the first thing I do is I get with a horse to where they only hear my voice. I get to where they can only hear my voice. And soon I give them a command, and they learn that when they obey a command, there's a reward from their master. And every command that they learn, he rewards them. They're being rewarded by their master. And they soon learn that direction that they are the ones to be mastered, and there's someone that they're submitting themselves to. So this horse only knows that it's there to listen to the commands that its master gives. And when the horse is performing in an arena before thousands of people, He's not doing it for the ovation, or for the attention, or for the applause. He's doing it because he wants to please his master. When we are broken, everything we do, we want to please our master. And to get to that place, we have to get into a relationship with him where we can only hear his voice. You see, we hear God's voice, and the commands that God gives us always has a reward. There's nothing that God will ever ask you to do that God does not have a reward for you or a blessing. But we have to be willing to hear and obey his voice. In a world that we enter now, today everybody has something in their ears at all times, it seems. A get up in the morning, we have our iPod, our iPads, our music, our noise in our ears. And there's so much that we miss that still, small voice that God gives us. Oh, I listen to sermons, and I listen to gospel music, I listen to my podcast, but you still are missing that real, small voice. If God doesn't compete to try to get our attention. We had to be attuned to God's voice. I was sharing earlier that when we're here and listen to 89.1 in Phoenix, it's, it's, a power, it's Air One, 89.1, Contemporary Christian. But as you get into Tucson, it becomes NPR. And as you're traveling through, you lose one voice or one frequency, and you start to hearing something different. Same frequency, different voice. As we travel away from God, we're going to start hearing a different voice. And we would think that we didn't change. Nothing has changed but a different voice. And if we're not careful, we'll think that's the same voice that we used to hear. That's how we have to know God's voice. When we know his voice, we listen to his commands. And that's the one that we're going to follow. First one, I want you to understand that there's a difference between being childish and childlike. When I was a child, I thought as a child. I spoke as a child. I reasoned as a child, right? But when I became a man, I put away childish 
things, not childlike things, childish things. And as children, we become self-centered, proud, mine. Everything is about us. If I had it and you've got it now, it's still mine. If I had it yesterday and you've got it today, it's still mine. But no matter what, it goes back to us. Enough about me, now you, you talk about me. He used an example in Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 2. Jesus called the little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, As surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. When you're really humble, you go wherever God tells you to go, do whatever he tells you to do, for however long he tells you to do it, and with whoever he wants you to do it with. Because we often want to do it with our crowd. God will put you in a crowd of people who don't look like you, don't think like you, don't talk like you, and, and may not even like you. But that's God. Because God always tells you what he wants you to do and always puts you in a place where he wants you to be. But it takes humility to know that we're in the right place. Because we don't like something, we want to assume that this is not good. No, no, God, this is not the right spot. This is no, no, God, you got to find me somewhere else. God said, no, this is the place you're meant to be. Because there's something going to happen to you right here at this place. There's a Syrian officer named Naaman. And he had leprosy. And at that time, there was nothing could ever be done with a person who had leprosy. They would tend to die as leprous, and they would be separated from everyone else. But this officer had an Egyptian servant girl who told the mistress, if my master would go to the prophet who was in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. Again, voice of God speaking. You have to understand that God speaks sometimes through people that you may not understand. People that just, just hear the voice of God. Somehow Naaman listened to this, to this voice and he decided to go to Samaria and see this certain prophet. And he went through a lot of details, bringing his big entourage and all of his people, and he brought gifts for the prophet. And when he got to the door of the prophet, uh, he was humble. The prophet came to him. And, no, the prophet actually didn't even come to the door. The prophet sent his servant and says, go and dip seven times in the Jordan River and you'll be cleansed. But Naaman became furious, went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. We can believe that God should do it the way that we think he should do it. We create God in our image. God wouldn't do that. No, God don't want me to do that. God don't act like that. God doesn't do it this way. And we create the response that we expect God to make. When Naaman was furious, again, he stepped in humbly, followed the voice of God, came to the place where he was going to receive healing, and then he stepped back into pride. And pride leads to destruction. If we don't just follow God all the way, we can get our own way and miss the blessing of God. Our own pride, our own voice, our own personality, our own character can get in our way. So he went away furious because he didn't like the way that he was treated. Doesn't mean that it was wrong, he just didn't like it. And he was contemplating whether he really wanted to follow what was given to him, because he thought that he deserved something better. Well, as he went away, he talked to one of the servants, and one of the servants said that he'd given you some great thing to do, wouldn't you have done it? If he'd give you some great thing to do and you've done it, then why didn't you do some small thing? And then Naaman decided he'd follow and do what was requested him, of him to do. He went and he dipped in that dirty Jordan River. He thought, there's better rivers where I live. Why don't you just tell me to dip somewhere else? But it's not about dipping. It's about being obedient to do what God's telling us to do. He dipped the first time, and I'm sure every time he goes down, he comes up, and he looks around, he's muddy, and he's dirty, and, and, and he's thinking, this, is, this can't be working. But he kept dipping, and the seventh time, the Bible says his skin came up just as clean as a child because he was willing to be humble and follow, just going through and doing what God told us to do. That's what it means to be obedient. Not our way and not our will, but ultimately we have to allow God's will to be done. Is that right? 
because we can easily step in and think for God and tell God how to do it. And God, I got a better plan. Here's how we should do it, God. You know, I was thinking about this. God, let me, let me show you this. Here's what I, I think we can do this, do this. And we want God to approve our plan. You want to make God laugh? Just tell God what you think. <laughs> Number two, your purpose will determine your position. Colossians 3 and 23 says, whatever you do, whatever you do, that means wherever you position, wherever you are, do it heartily. That means with all of your heart, with gladness, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Do all that you do. I mean, do it with all of your heart. Dr. King put it this way, that if you are a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper that you can be. So that when people look at you, they say, there goes a great street sweeper. Whatever you do, do it not as so any recognition. That no one should say, hey, you did a great job. If nobody pats you on the back, if nobody applauds you, know that you're doing it as unto the Lord. And it's God that ultimately is the one that rewards everything that we do. Give God glory for all that he does, because it's him that steps in. There was a guy I was hearing about who's a real estate very big real estate uh, investor and agent. He says when he started out as a real estate agent, he was very young and he wanted the listings that he saw a lot of people have these big listings where he can make a lot of money. But he didn't know how to break into this industry, especially at that level. And he got a call from a lady who wanted to lease an apartment. And for an agent, that's not the dream client. They don't go around trying to find leases for people because leases don't pay as well unless the terms are right and the amount is right. He says that he thought he's not doing anything better. He will take her around and show a few things. We showed her a few places that she didn't like any of them. And she asked him if they could go out another time. And he was thinking, I really didn't want to go this time. He says he started putting together listings and trying to find what it was she liked. He listened to her and he kept going back and he'd take her out and she didn't like those. And he'd come back and he'd make another listing and, and he's listing more and understanding. And six months went by before he finally found her the perfect spot. And she loved it. And he was thinking, glad that's done. Six months went by of him taking her around to find the right apartment for herself. Well, she calls her father and invites him out to visit. And as she's on the phone, the father says, well, finally you found a place. How did you find it? And she started to talk about the agent. See, I found this agent who was so patient, so wonderful, and you got to meet him. He's the most wonderful person, not money hungry. He was very giving. And, and, and I mean, you just got to meet this person. Now, in that same office was the CEO of the company. The CEO says, I want to know who that agent is because I want to sell the penthouse that I have. When he went to get the listing, he found that the penthouse was selling for $4 million. And as he was showing this property, in walks a major celebrity who looks at this and says, this is cool, but do you have anything any cooler? Can you find anything else for me? And he went out and did exactly what he did with the apartment dwelling. He searched and he got his listings together. And this celebrity ended up buying $11 million property from him. He's $11 million plus the $4 million that he'd already had a listing for. That was a good year, wasn't it? But it started in low position. You see, you don't know what God has been trying to do. When you've been positioned in some low positions, you may have given out and got impatient. After the first month, you may have stopped. I don't need this. This is not working for me. But God is saying it's working for me because there's something he's trying to do. You don't know what's on the other side of that. There's a side of through. It's going through that's difficult, but the other side of through is where the blessing is. And we've got to always keep our mind on the other side of through. Not while you're going through it. Not while you're in it. It always seems like a whole bunch of stuff is going on while you're in it. But if you ever get through it, you can look back and get a different perspective on it. You find out that sometimes it was necessary. You are here because you are allowed to be there. You are where you are because God allowed you to be where you are. It was a privilege to be where you are because God was trying to move you up through low position. But that requires humility, requires us to see more than ourselves and doing all that we do to be a grace and a glory to God. Be a grace, never a disgrace. 
Whenever we want to hold our head down and complain and do everything that the world does, we're being a disgrace. But when we want to hold our head high and be joyful, even when there's nothing it seems to be happy about, you're going to hold your head high and you're going to give your best countenance. Now you're being a grace to God. And there's something about God's grace that's just amazing. That when you show it, if you take initial faith to show it, God will take result of faith. Because he knows every struggle that you're going through. He knows your hardship. He knows how difficult it is for you. But he also knows that you're well able to overcome it. But the way you do that, you've got to be a little less of you and a little bit more of him. And the difficulty for us is to put ourselves behind. It's to think about something other than ourselves. Can I get amen? Amen. Amen. We should seek service over status. Moses was the most humble man on earth, and God loved Moses. And one of the things that God does, when he loves you, God protects you. God gives you the endurance. He gives you the strength. We had talked in our class earlier, in our gifts class, about when you're doing God's will, God steps in. He will sustain you. And you don't have something that just lasts a short time where you have one-hit wonders. God will take you through it all. He'll take you through. You'll endure the storm and the hardship. And while others have fallen by the wayside, you're still standing. And God will prop you up on every leaning side. And you don't know how it happened. And people will look at you and say, well, how are you able to do it? You know, I, I couldn't do it. But I know that God did it. I don't know how God did it. I don't know when God did it. But one thing I do, I can look back and I can know that it was God that did it. Can you make that testimony? Can you look back and know that it was him that did it for you? It wasn't because you were so good. It wasn't that you were deserving. You didn't know anything more than others knew. But you had a God who just never gave up on you. And you trusted him and you endured the hardship and the struggles. And God built you up because you were ultimately desiring to do his will and to give him the glory. Miriam and Aaron were Moses' brother and sister. And Miriam and Aaron uh, had became jealous. Now Moses was the most humble person. He did whatever God wanted him to do. But they became jealous. And then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman. So Moses had married an Ethiopian woman. And Miriam and Aaron, then they had something to say about it. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Mm, Got to be careful what you say about an anointed person, right? When God's all over you, you tell your, tell your enemies, you be careful what you say about me. You better be careful what you say about me. When God loves you, your enemies, anybody who has something against you, you got to be careful. The Bible says, those that bless you, I will bless. But those who curse you, he says, I will curse. So you got to know that when you got somebody around you that's blessed, bless the blessed person. If you want to be blessed, bless somebody who's blessed. Just a tip. Bless somebody who God's already blessing. It's like finding a hot tip when when you're investing in the stock market. Invest in a blessed person. Because whom you, God has blessed, if you bless them, God says, I will bless you accordingly. But be careful not to curse anybody. Because sometimes a person may be blessed and we may be jealous of them because we don't like the favor that we see because God's not favoring us or whatever we see that we don't see happening with us. We tend to speak against people like that. One of those I, I caution people is I know I love Joel Osteen. Now, you know Joel Osteen? Uh, I love him. He's anointed, but a lot of the professional Christians don't like Joel because he's at all that good old feel-good Christianity. He waters it down. He always this goodwill. You know, Joel is doing something that nobody else is doing, and God has blessed him. He has the largest church in the nation. Over 100,000 people come to his church, uh, to that church, every weekend, and millions of people around the world, his books and things are selling in record numbers. He's packing stadiums. Now, God's got to be in there somewhere, don't you think? You don't, God, all that good doesn't happen without God being present. And the ones who want to talk him down or have chinks in his armor, they got to be careful what they say. Because when a person is blessed and you see God's presence there, just listen and try and learn from them. Don't blow out somebody else's candle to try and make yours shine brighter. It's God that ignites. It's God that illuminates. It's God that glorifies. So when they spoke against uh, Moses, the Bible says God was watching. 
When they looked at Miriam, she was as white as, as snow. She was a leper. And they prayed God, you know, th- th- that God would relent from this punishment. And then God says, put her away seven days outside the camp. And seven days outside the camp, he restored her. But he let them know that there's a position, there's a place where he is. God punishes disobedience. A couple of verses here on, hum- on uh, humility. But he who is greatest among you shall be a servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humble. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he, exalt, that he may exalt you in due time. There was a champion that, uh, in, in bodybuilding that beat Arnold Schwarzenegger's record some years back. And he was one of the most humble guys that there was. And he noticed that there was a guy that was competing in the same area that he was, and he was doing very well. Now, if you're the champion, you want to keep everybody down. So what he did was he caught this guy and says, I want you to train with me. So here he is, train this guy, who's his competitor. And as they trained together, this guy moved up from eighth place to fourth place to third place, and he was second place to him. And every year they competed, the champion was first place, and this guy was second place. Every year, first and second. First and second. Now this guy that was in second place, his number one goal was to beat the champion. The champion's number one goal was to try and help somebody. See, if you just have your goal to try and do all that you can to help somebody else, God's the one that will position you where he wants you to be. But if your goal is to try and win, win, I want to beat everybody, that means for a winner, there has to be a loser. With God, everyone wins. See, as you try to help someone else win, God says, I'll make sure that you win. You don't have to worry about you. I'll take care of you. I've got you. But if you will look at somebody else and figure out how you can help them to win, that's the servant that God wants us to be, to humble ourselves, to make everybody a champion. I see everybody in here as being God's champion. You are God's champion. There's something that God has in store for every one of us. But in order to get there, we've got to figure out how we can humble ourselves and put ourselves in a position of service so that God exalts us. He exalts us through service. There are plenty of opportunities and privileges to do things at our church. We put sign-up sheets out. Even next weekend, they're asking for helpers to volunteer here and do stuff. And then someone says, oh, not me. I could do it. It's just wrong guy, wrong gal, whatever. And God is trying to find a way to bless you. He's trying to find a way to move you in a place where he can give you what he wants for you. But it starts in a position where you got to get rid of ourselves and start in low position. When you're truly a humble, you're not listening to anyone else but the voice of God. And you'll go where God tells you to go. Do what God tells you to do. You'll be whatever God tells you to be. And whenever you deviate from that position, you know it. You know when you're off track. When you're in place with God, there's a position. There's a relationship. There's something that you feel in his presence. And when you get away from him, it's very clear that we need to navigate back toward God. Now, if you've never felt that the way you should, you've got to draw closer. You've got to draw closer. As God is giving you direction and God is speaking something to everybody else and you feel that he's speaking to you, you move. Because if you don't move, somebody else will do it. But somebody else is going to get your blessing. Don't let someone else get what was intended for you. And you're watching and saying, you know, I, you know that, and feeling upset because somebody else has got something that you don't have. See, they were willing to be humble sometimes and do what you were not willing to do. It's God that exalts. It's God that exalts. The more we humble ourselves, the least shall be the greatest.